thankful for your goodness and your love and your grace. Father, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you would speak to us through your word now this morning. I pray that you'll help us to focus and to concentrate on the truth as we bring it from your word today. That, Lord, you'd not let our mind wander, and we'd not hear what the Spirit would say to its church this morning. Help me as I bring this message today, and please help the folks as they listen. May your will be done in the next few moments. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This might need a little help today, Dean. I'm, I think my voice got sunburnt yesterday. So. In Hebrews chapter 6, the book of Hebrews is a wonderful book. And Paul's writing to some here of the Jews who have come to understand Christianity and what believing in Christ is all about. One of the themes of Hebrews is Christ is better, better than Moses, better than Abraham, better than the sacrifices, better than all the rituals and ordinances of Judaism, that Christ is the Messiah. He's the one to trust. And they, they would come to understand this and know that, and yet they turn back to their Judaism. Uh, that's their, that was their comfort zone. That's what they knew. Uh, that's what they were comfortable with. And so they returned to that. And Paul writes in verse number 9 of Hebrews chapter 6, he said, Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. And that little phrase I want you to think about with me this morning, things that accompany salvation. You know, we talk about being saved and 
trusting Christ as your Savior. What goes along with that? Is that just something you do that uh, you, you, you made a decision and you asked Christ to save you and you remember doing that maybe years ago, but it really hasn't had any impact in your life? Uh, there's nothing that came along with that. That's just something I did years ago. And uh, when I heard that uh, I, should, I should get saved, I got saved. And uh, that's all you know about it. Uh, but is there anything, what, what accompanies salvation? What was Paul referring to? Uh, what is it that goes along with God's gift of eternal life? What is it that apparently there's some things that accompany that? There's things that go alongside of that. Literally, the word is an echo. Uh, it, 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 it comes back to us with what God's worked in us. And, and for us, I think, to really understand the things that accompany salvation, I want us to go back to the book of Acts. Would you turn to Acts chapter 2? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. And I'd like you to look at Acts chapter 2, which is what's called Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, the, the feast of first fruits, if you will. And Pentecost is celebrated, and of course, that's when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 that were in the upper room, and they were able to preach the gospel in the languages of the people that were present. Um, I, uh, listen, you're, you're in an independent Baptist church this morning. Um, we, we don't believe that the Bible teaches you speak in an unknown language. Okay, I don't think the Bible teaches that. And th there are tongues, and tongues is just what it says. I'm speaking English. That's my tongue. That's my native tongue. Are my native language. We have uh, folks, we had Brother Levine in here not too, much, too long ago who could speak 17 languages and uh, fluently and uh, I mean with the right um, accent and everything. Now he didn't speak Tennessee I don't think but uh, he, uh, uh, he, he spoke all the languages with the right accents and everything and uh, he was telling me how he met a couple from Germany one day. They were talking German and didn't think anybody understood what he was saying until he entered their conversation. And uh, they asked him what part of Germany he was from. He goes, oh, I'm not from Germany. And they didn't believe him because he had such a good accent along with the being able to speak fluent German. Now, Brother Levine, by the way, I think that's a gift of tongues. I think that's a gift of languages that he, God has enabled him to be able to learn these languages. And that's what happened. The, the languages were of people who were dwelling on the earth at that time. They had gathered to Jerusalem. And what happened was God gave them the, the supernatural ability to preach the gospel in the language of the people that were there so they would understand the gospel and be saved. Uh, there was a purpose for it. It wasn't for the apostles to say, hey, look at me. Look, I can speak a language that I don't know what I'm saying. It was for them to hear about Jesus Christ. Uh, somebody said to take out of that passage and want to just speak in tongues and forget about the people who were saved it would be like me handing you a million dollars in a paper sack and you dumping out the million dollars and taking the paper sack and being excited. You're missing the real thing. The real thing is 3,000 people heard the gospel and got saved that day. That's what it was all about. So let's look at Acts chapter 2 and beginning towards the end of the chapter in verse number 41. The apostles now have preached, not only Peter, but he did preach, but he was one of many that preached that day. And verse 41 says, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted to them to, parted to, parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, Here's 3,000 that got saved in one day. What accompanied their salvation? What came along with them when they accepted Christ as their Savior? Let me make sure. None of these things we'll talk about today means you're more saved or less saved. If you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're as saved as you'll ever get. Uh, there's, somebody said, well, he really got saved. Well, the Bible never says anything about anybody really getting saved. 
All right, you're either saved or you're lost. Uh, you either know Christ your Savior or you don't know Christ as your Savior. But when you receive Christ your Savior by faith, you're saved. And when that happens, there are things that accompany that. And the very first thing we see here, when they received His Word, when they believed on Christ, they were baptized. That's the first thing that accompanies salvation is baptism. Now, it doesn't mean you're saved. It means it comes along with the salvation. It's the first step of obedience after you're saved. Notice they, these 3,000 were baptized the same day. And by the way, that's always the Bible plan. The Bible plan was when folks got saved, they immediately got baptized. Several years ago, I had a fellow who said, I think we got a plan for getting people baptized. He said, when they get saved, I think we should have a committee of three or four men, and they ought to uh, uh, pr come before those men and give their testimony, and then we ought to watch them for a period of, oh, a month or six weeks and make sure that they're genuinely saved and really saved before we let them get baptized. And, and I was sitting at a table with this man. I said, man, I think that's a wonderful idea. And he goes, you do? And I said, sure. I said, I just have one problem with it. And he said, what's that? I said, it's not in the Bible. There's no Bible basis for that. See, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man. But uh, th that isn't what the Bible teaches. Why? Every time in the Bible, here, 3,000 of them got saved. And guess what? 3,000 of them got baptized immediately. Why? It's the first step of obedience. It's simply as identifying you with Jesus Christ. When you go into the baptistry, and you stand in the water, you're letting everybody know out here that I've received Jesus as my Savior. And when you're, you're buried in the likeness of His death and were raised in the likeness of His resurrection, you're saying to everybody out here, I believe Christ died for my sins, He was buried, and He rose again for me. And you're identifying yourself with Christ. Uh, it happened that way here at Pentecost. A little bit later, when you get to Acts chapter 8, and Philip goes and was able to win an Ethiopian eunuch to Christ. You remember going through the desert? Uh, the eunuch said, hey, wait, here's some water. What doth hinder me to get baptized? And they stopped the chariot. Philip said, you believe with all your heart? He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he said, okay, uh, let's stop right here. And they both went down into the water. By the way, that means baptism always pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, if baptism was by throwing some little water on your head or dumping a little water on your head, they probably had enough water in the chair to take care of that. They didn't need to stop and go down into the water to get baptized, but both of them went down into the water. Why? Baptism pictures the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Um, you know, next time you go to a funeral, just take a little cup of dirt and throw it on the guy in the casket and say, okay, I think he's buried. Uh, I don't think that's going to work, does it? Uh, no, he's not buried when you just throw a little word. And you're not baptized when you get a little water thrown on your head. Okay? Boy, don't bow your head. It's not time to pray. This... Should I go out and look at the sign? Does it say Baptist out there still? I mean, this is a Baptist church, all right? And that is what the Bible teaches, all right? And it's always immediately after you get saved. In fact, when someone gets saved and they understand I should be baptized, you know what? That's a good thing. That shows that their heart's in the right place, and they want to do what God wants them to do. That's a positive thing. And it happened in, in Acts chapter 9 when Saul got saved and God had him blinded, but he led him into a to, to place, and guess what? He got baptized. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, we studied in Sunday school today. After they received Christ their Savior, they and, and the people who believed with him all got baptized. It happens every time. The, 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 the jailer in uh, Acts 16, uh, where the Philippian jailer, when, when the earthquake came in the middle of the night, they spoke the word unto him and to all that were in his house. And the same hour of the night, he and the Mrs. Jailer and all the little jailers, they all got baptized and because they, they all believed in Jesus. And they got baptized immediately. And so baptism always comes. It's not salvation. Somebody ask you, do you know if you died, you go to heaven? And your first response should not be, well, I was baptized. No, no, no. Then you're trusting the wrong thing. Okay? Your first response ought to be when you trusted Jesus as your Savior. Or I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. That's what takes you to heaven. That's what gives you eternal life. Then you are obedient in baptism. Okay? Are we clear on that? But that accompanies it. That goes along with it. I've, I've, I, I don't know in 33 years of, of ministering for the Lord, I don't know I've ever seen a Christian greatly used of God who was not baptized. That's just an area of disobedience. And once you know what God wants you to do, and, and you're saying, no, I'm not going to do it, uh, you don't get much more from God. So you have to take that important step, baptism. That's important. And then the second thing we see here is this. Look, 
Uh, the second thing we see is they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. You go down to verse number 47. It says that Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice again in verse 41. They were baptized in the same day that were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. When it says added unto them, added unto them, who's them? Yeah, the church. The 120 that were meeting in the upper room, and now after the big day, they had 3,120. The Lord added to the church. So what comes after baptism for a new Christian? Church membership comes. You ought to be a member of a church. You ought to join with a body of believers, and, and you're added to the church. When you're saved and you're baptized, you're added to the church. R.G. Lee, a great preacher, for years pastored the Bellevue Baptist Church. In fact, he pastored the church that Adrian Rogers pastored uh, for years. Some of you are familiar with Adrian Rogers. You still hear him on the radio. Adrian Rogers in heaven. But as the scripture says, he being dead yet speaketh. Amen. And uh, still get to hear those messages and, uh, and be blessed by them. But R.G. Lee was for him a great, great preacher. Famous sermon, Payday Someday, by R.G. Lee. If you've never heard that sermon, you ought to, you ought to Google it and find it. I'm sure it's online. And listen to that great sermon by R.G. Lee. But R.G. Lee said this, when asked, can a Christian, can I be a Christian without joining a church? And R.G. Lee replied, yes, that's very possible. It's about as possible as being a student that doesn't go to school. A soldier who won't join the army. A citizen who doesn't pay taxes or vote. A salesman with no customers. An explorer with no base camp. A seaman on a ship without a crew. A businessman on a deserted island. An author without readers. A tuba player without an orchestra. A parent without a family. A football player without a team. A politician who's a hermit. A scientist who doesn't share his findings. Or a bee without a hive. How about that? Hey, it, it's very simple. You, you, you receive Christ your Savior. You know what happened? God does a work in your heart. Salvation's a heart issue. And what happens is when you get saved, God changes your heart. And all of a sudden, you, you begin to have a desire for things. And people who didn't want to darken the door of a church, once they come to know Jesus, they have a desire to be in church. They have a desire to be around the people of God. Uh, before, before you, you may be here today and you say, man, I've come to church all the time, but boy, I tell you what, before you met Christ, it wasn't that way. You really didn't. In fact, you may have talked bad about the people who were in this room. Not these particular people, but people who gather in church. They, that wasn't your crowd. What, what changed you? Jesus changed you. And when He changes you, He changes your heart, and now you have a desire. You got baptized, and you want to belong. You want to be part of a local, independent, Bible-believing, Christ-honoring, sin-hating uh, gospel church. You want to be a part of that, and that's scriptural. You know what? That accompanies salvation. That just goes along with it, all right? So what accompanies salvation? Baptism does. What accompanies salvation? Church membership does. What else accompanies salvation? Verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine is Bible teaching, all right? Bible teaching, Bible preaching. You know, one of the things that, that I experienced when I got saved, and I was saved as a young boy, but... Right away, I had a desire to want to read the Bible. And, and I remember my, my father buying me my first Bible and going home and, and, and sitting down. And, and uh, I don't know, where, where, do you, where do you start reading? I read where you're supposed to start reading a book in the beginning. And I uh, opened up Genesis 1 and started reading. And, uh, and it's great the way I'm glad God put Genesis as the first book in the Bible. Genesis is a great book. And uh, it's an exciting book, and a lot of great, great stories in Genesis. And, and I remember just, just sitting down and reading the Bible. I had a desire to read a book as a young boy that didn't even have any pictures in it. And, uh, it was, and I thought it was pretty good. Uh, that, that desire, you begin to have a desire for the Bible. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2 says, You desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. One of the things that takes place when you get saved, one of those things that comes along with salvation is you get a desire for the Bible. Now, truly, before you were saved, you didn't have any. 
Most people who are not Christians, they don't read the Bible. There's no interest in that book. Nothing that, that, nothing that, that drives them or, or, or motivates them to want to, to, to be in the Bible. And by, certainly nothing that makes them want to come and listen to the Bible being preached or Bible being taught. And, and yet that's essential to the growth of a new believer. You desire the sincere milk of the Word that you can grow thereby. You know, it's just as natural for a, a, a newborn babe to desire sustenance, to desire milk, to desire that bottle. They, 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 they're, they're, they want it and they're hungry for it. In fact, they'll begin to get fussy and cry if they don't get it. Huh? Do you ever get a little fussy and a little, and you say, I'm sorry, I'm a little crabby. I haven't heard, I haven't, haven't heard any preaching for a, for a few days. Huh? I haven't, I'm just getting hungry for some Bible. And uh, so I get a little grumpy when that happens. No, you don't get that way. But we ought to. We ought to desire the milk of the Word. Why? That's how we grow. So I stress to new Christians, listen, the best thing you can do, the best decision you make in your life is when you decide, I'm saved, I'm going to be baptized, I'm going to join the church, and then I am going to be faithful to the church. I'm going to come Sunday morning, I'm going to come Sunday night, I'm going to come Wednesday night, I'm going to be there when the doors are open. My, my friend, that, those are the believers that grow. Those are the believers that see God do something in their life. And changes take place. But you have to set that down. That's not going to be a decision. Don't decide, am I going tonight? Don't decide, am I going to go this time? No, no, no. Set it. Sunrise east sets in the west. Two plus two is four. Water runs downhill. I'm going to church. That's all there is to it. And I'm going to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm just going to be there. It's going to be my schedule, going to be my cadence. It's going to be my life. And that's what I'm going to do. And things will revolve around that schedule. And you'll see God do some great things in your life. And so we desire the Word of God. When I've seen people fall away from God, you know where it starts? Church attendance. Start missing. Start hitting and missing. And then they, they don't listen to the preaching. When they do come... Their mind's somewhere else, thinking about other things, playing games on their phone during church. Hmm? You know, just thinking about other things, not paying attention. And then pretty soon you miss once, and you miss twice, then you miss another time. And once you miss, it gets easier to miss again. And pretty soon, there, uh, pretty soon somebody says, "Hey, where? Whatever happened to so and so?" And they're they're gone. They're not here anymore. Not around. And they've what? What's the Bible call that? Backsliding, slid away from God. And it happens that way when you start leaving the things of God. And by the way, I'll guarantee you, you go talk to someone like that before the church attendance fell off, that fell off. Hmm? Bible laid silent. Huh? You shouldn't have to ask on a Sunday morning, hey, anybody seen my Bible? I go to church. Where's my Bible? Well, it's in the back car window where you left it last Sunday. See, that, that'll say a lot. Huh? You ought, to, you ought to got to have the Bible every day. You got to have the Bible every day. And so you desire the apostles' doctrine. They desired the Bible teaching and the Bible teaching. And then, notice, he says, the, they continue the apostles' doctrine. Notice, fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Fellowship in prayer. The breaking of bread there, I think, is a reference to the Lord's table. Uh, exam, a time of examination of yourself. The Bible says, before you come to the table of fellowship, the table of the Lord, you make sure that there's no sin in your life. Why? Because he is, uh, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And, and what separates us from God is sin. Sin will separate us. Our iniquities will separate us from God. And so if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. And so I, I can't harbor sin. I can't have sin and still say I'm in fellowship with God. No, I have to walk in the light as he is in the light and then I'll have fellowship one with another all right and that's how I give fellowship and so I'm fellowship and I'm I'm making sure I'm living as I ought to live because listen hey how do I know the right way to live well I just am continuing in the doctrine remember the fellow the the, the the word of God the teaching preaching the reading of the word of God now you know what happens that's going to show me that's going to point out areas of my life that are not pleasing to God that's going to point out things in my life that God says, hey, this has to get cleaned up. Hey, this, I, I, I need to change this. Why? God is shaping us and forming us to be like Jesus. And for most of us, he's got quite a bit of work to do. Okay? And he's got to, he's got to get rid of some things. 
And sometimes there's got to be surgeries. And he's got to extricate things out of our life. And it's not real comfortable. Okay? But it's for our good. And it's for his glory. And so we have to let God do that. And allow God to do that. And so we want to walk in the light as he is in the light. As you study the word of God, as you hear the word of God taught, as you hear the word of God preached, this is the light of the truth of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This lights the way. This is the way. Walk ye in it. And you learn what it is. To what God says is right. What God says is not right. And you learn what God says we are, how we ought to live. And the Bible, by the way, you say, oh, nobody telling me what to do. You better let God tell you what to do. God is, gonna, God is the one, and you've got to follow the way He tells you to live. Com that accompanies salvation. Wanting to obey God, wanting to live as He wants you to live, that accompanies salvation. You can say, well, I, I'm, I'm a homosexual, and I, I, I'm a Christian. The problem is, that doesn't accompany salvation. Well, I'm, I, I'm not giving up my rock and roll music, but I'm a Christian. Listen, you have to be careful. That doesn't accompany salvation. Hello? Well, I want to be immoral. I want to live the way I want to do what I want to do. But I'm a Christian. Wait a minute. That immoral, life of immorality doesn't accompany salvation. Okay? You, you can claim anything you want, but there are certain things that accompany salvation, and one of them is living the way God tells you to live. And let's, let's make sure we're living as God says we should live and walking in the light as He is in the light. Let's, get, I just, let's just get back to being Christians again. Let's get back to living for God again. Let's get back to being what, what Bible Christians ought to be. And let's be what we should be. Let's not be hypocritical about it. A hypocrite is somebody who pretends to be something they're not. Well, listen, why am I trying to be like the world if I'm not? If I'm saved, I'm not going to try to be like the world. Why would I try to act like a sinner, a heathen on their way to hell? When I'm not, I'm saved, I'm on the way to heaven. I don't want to be a reverse hypocrite <laughs> and try to be something I'm not. I'm an out-and-out -out Christian, and I want to be one. I was made, and you were made to fellowship with God. You were made to have a relationship with Him. And so when you're saved, yes, we're saved from hell, and that's why most of us get saved. But the truth is, that's not fulfilling the purpose God saved you just because, well, I'm not going to hell. Well, that's all that matters. No, it isn't all that matters. What matters is, are you glorifying God with your life? You're supposed to now, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, you're supposed to do all to the glory of God. Are you, are you striving for that? If not, then God's not finished with you yet. And you, you're not, don't say that's all that matters. Not until you can say with Jesus Christ uh, that I always do the things that please Him. Now, when you get to that point, you can say, okay, that's all that matters. Okay? Most of us aren't there yet. I'm not sure any of us are there yet. All right? So we see that what accompanies salvation is baptism. What accompanies salvation is church membership. What accompanies salvation is a desire for the Word of God. And what, is, what accompanies salvation is the fellowship in the prayer, the time with God. And then notice verse 44. The Bible says, And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. You know what, you know what accompanies salvation? Giving. Giving. You know what these folks started wanting to do? They, wanted to, they, they saw others in their congregation that needed help, or needed something, and they just gave it to them. They just had a real heart to give. You can give without loving, but you won't love without giving. It's impossible. The Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The old country preacher said, all money's tainted. Taint mine and it taint yours. It belongs to God. And that's true. Oh, I was talking Tennessee there, wasn't I? All right. You know, years ago, a man sat meditating in his office across the street from the great First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. It was during the Great Depression in the country and a visitor entered in and saw the man staring out the window, and he said, he was staring across the window at the, at the church, and he said, you got a lot of money tied up over there, don't you? He said, yes, sir, was the reply, about $40,000. A lot of money in those days. Huh, a lot of money in these days, too. And he, uh, he said, you're probably thinking if you could have that back, you'd keep it. And the man said, looked at the visitor, and he said, You know, when that church was being built, you had more money than I. I put mine in the building, and if I recollect, you kept yours. But now, 
we're both broke. But I have something to show for mine. What do you have to show for yours? Hmm? Who is, he asked him, who is more broke? Good question. What a company salvation a desire to give to the work of God. You know, when, when someone you love has a, if someone you love has an illness or a sickness and you get them to the doctor and they say a surgery is necessary or some operation must take place and you don't say, well, now, wait a minute, how much is that going to cost? You don't even think about money. You'd say, if that's what's needed to save their life, let's go. What are we waiting on? Why? Because you love that person. You don't even think about the money. Hmm? Think about it. When you really love something, you don't think about the money. I know folks who love, uh, you know, uh, folks who, when, when you love, there, there are people who just love Ohio State football. And I mean, I mean to where they don't think anything. Who did I run into the other day? I ran into somebody who said, oh, I was in, uh, was it Texas where they played the championship game this year? Oh, I was there. I was there. Talk about all the, all the stuff they did and everything. Uh, I, uh, you were dropping some pretty good, pretty good coin to get down there and watch that game, weren't you? I mean, I was into thousands of dollars, if I remember right. Different things they have going on. Now, maybe somebody took care of it, but you know what? There were, you know what she said? Uh, it, was a, it was a girl, and she said, you know what? There weren't hardly any Oregon fans there. Yeah. And you remember, it was a lot of red in that, in that crowd that night. But you know what I mean? People don't have any problem dropping thousands of dollars. Why? They love the Buckeyes. They love the Buckeyes. They're just fanatical about it. And listen, the, the only, only people who complain, when, they don't complain about when they raise ticket prices. They don't complain. They just give. They just give. They just fork it over. But boy, it, it, it all depends on where you love. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You want to love the things of God? Start giving to the things of God. Hmm? Start giving to the things of God. I can tell you what. I don't know where. I don't know what you love, what you don't love. Just let me see your bank account. I'll tell you what you love. Because I'll just see what you spend your money on. And whatever you spend your money on, that's what you love. Okay. You can do it yourself. You don't have to have me look at it. You may not want me looking at your bank account. But that's how you can tell. And here they want to love. In fact, look, look, uh, look, look back in, um, we'll come back to Acts 2. But turn with me to Acts, I mean to Ephesians chapter 4. Would you look there, please? Ephesians chapter 4. Giving accompanies salvation. In Ephesians 4 now, there's, it starts the practical side of Ephesians and gives some very practical instructions as we get into chapter 4. He, he talks about putting off in verse 22, the former conversation, put off that old man, and he puts about, uh, put on the new man in verse 24, and, and then he says, put away lying in verse 25, speak every man truth with his neighbor. He says in verse 26, be ye angry and sin not, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Now look at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have it to buy the things he wants. Oh, no. That he may have it to get more stuff. So he may have it to rent a storage facility so he can build bigger barns and store more. No. What, that he may give to him that needs it? Why do you labor? Why do you work? So you have to give to help others. So you have to give to help others. That's why God gives you the ability to work and to labor. Now, if he put that in there, it must have been that they needed to hear it, and it must be that maybe we need to hear it. Because most people say, man, i got to, you know, uh, can get all I can and can all I get and sit on the can. Uh, I just got to hold on to everything. And I'm saving it for a rainy day. Well, you know what? It's raining on somebody today. And, and you got to be willing to give. That's why God gives it to you. And God allows you to work. And so we work 
so we have it to give. So we can have so we can have a day for the community like we had yesterday. That's so we can run a bus. So you can uh, pay the insurance and pay the fuel and uh, pay all the things we have to pay to get the bus going on the road. You see? That's because people work, and you know what? They love God, and they give. They give for that to happen. Giving just accompanies with it. Whenever, whenever you start feeling like, oh, man, i got to give again, then you got to check your heart. you got to say, Lord, have I forgotten what you've done for me? I've forgotten what you've uh, the, how much you've given for me. And by the way, if, if you don't want to give, God can dry up what he's given you. You understand? God can put you on your back anytime he wants. He can cut off the source of income anytime he wants. See? So as long as you continue to give, God keeps it coming. The moment you start getting it and sticking it in your pockets, then God will say, okay, I'm shutting off the valve not going to happen anymore it just goes along with salvation you have a desire to give then lastly back in Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 they continuing daily with one accord in the temple verse 46 and breaking bread from house to house to eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You begin to have a burden for other people. You begin to, you, you praise God for what He's done for you, but you know what? You, you begin to have a desire to want to see other people get saved. I want you to look at a couple of scriptures with me over in the book of Acts. You're in Acts 2. Just turn over to Acts 9, would you please? Saul, most of you know, was persecuting Christians prior to his getting saved in Acts chapter 9. And, and you see the, the, the persecution that he gave in the first few verses. It says in Acts 9.1 that Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against who? The disciples of the Lord. Man, he was going after Christians. And under the high priest, he went under the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way. See, Christianity is a way of life. Okay? And, and whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And that's when he was journeying to Damascus, and Jesus met him there and saved him. Now, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 10. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be in Acts 10, I should be in Romans 10. Go to Romans 10. I was looking at Acts 10, and I'm, I'm back to Cornelius again. Let's go to Romans 10. That's what I'm looking for. Now listen to what Paul says here. Brethren... Romans 10, verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Wow. That guy's sure changed, hadn't he? Notice what he says. I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. He says, I've got, a, I've got a burden for my people. What gave Paul that burden? What turned it around from persecuting Christians to wanting to see his own people come to Christ? He got saved. What accompanied that salvation? A burden to see other people saved. A burden to see his loved ones saved. I got saved as a young boy. We had... We had neighbors, the Spicer family, that lived next to us, and they had three boys. And, and, and they were our friends, and we did stuff together in the neighborhood. I won't tell you what stuff we did, but we did stuff. And, and, and I, but I had a desire to want to see them saved. And I remember uh, trying to tell them the best I could as a six-year-old boy uh, the gospel, but I just yeah, I got them to come to church. And I saw those boys get saved, and they got baptized. I just, I just came along with salvation. Nobody told me, hey, you ought to be concerned about them. I'm sure that, that might have been what was preached. But I don't recall anybody sitting me down and saying, now you've got to go talk to them. I just had that in my heart. I wanted to do that. That goes along with salvation. You get burdened for your loved ones. You get burdened for family members. I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if they're going to heaven. I wonder if they know Jesus. And, and I want them to be saved. When Jeannie got saved and and God did a work in her heart right away, concerned about her sister, concerned about her family. 
And now her sister's been saved, and her sister's fiancé's been saved. God's beginning to do to, to, to reach into that family and, and save souls. Why? Because somebody got burdened about it. Somebody, somebody got saved and said, man, I'm concerned about my family. What about you? What about your brothers or sisters? What about your mom or dad? What about your cousins? What about your aunts and uncles? Are they saved? Your children saved? Brother and sister saved? Are you praying that God will put someone in their life who they'll listen to? That you sit down or you get on the phone and talk to them and just say, listen, man, I, I, I've got to have a few minutes and just listen to them. And at least give them the gospel. Things that accompany salvation. Baptism. Membership in the church. A desire for the word of God. And, and not only in your own personal time of reading the Bible and wanting to read the Bible, but wanting to be where the Bible's taught and the Bible is preached. Fellowship and prayer. Fellowshipping with God, enjoying time with Him. Fellowshipping with believers. Spending time talking to the Lord in prayer. Giving and a burden for the lost. That's what these early Christians experienced when they got saved. That's what some of you experienced when you got saved. You look back, you see how God began to, these things begin to take place in your life. Well, what happened? But it all comes back to salvation. It all comes back to when you got saved. And then these things accompanied salvation. This, this idea of people you know, saved and, and, and nothing comes along with it. That's not the salvation the Bible's talking about. And if you say, I've got salvation or, or there's, there's nothing that came along with it, you need to look at your own heart. And say, I want to make sure that I, I truly am saved and that Christ is my Savior. Because Paul would say, I'm persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now in prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention. Lord, we thank you for Paul addressing this issue with the Christians there and that he wrote to the, the, the Hebrews that he was trying to convince that Christ is the Messiah. Christ is our Savior. That they would have things that accompany salvation. Lord, we read in the book of Acts that day of Pentecost and the things that accompanied those 3,000 that got saved that day and continued on with the early church there. You did some amazing things in their midst. And I pray this morning, God, that each individual here would look at their own heart and life and thy Holy Spirit would speak to their heart, that they could see in their life things that accompany salvation they would know that they've truly been born again. And Lord, if there some in the room today are looking at their life and they would have to truly honestly say, I don't have anything that accompanies salvation like the preacher talked about today. I pray that today they'd be willing to come and bow the knee and receive your gift of salvation and the things that accompany that salvation. And Lord, I pray there'd be others in the room today who just might say, you know what, I, I need to have a burden for my lost family members, loved ones who I care about, that they too would come to know Christ as their Savior. Have your way in this invitation, please. Now our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and I'll finish praying in just a moment, and we'll have our invitation. I just wondered this morning with our heads bowed, how many folks in the room would say, Pastor, I, I know that I'm saved. I know I, I, I look in my life and the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I not only have salvation, but I see the things that accompany salvation as well. And Pastor, I know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I know I'm saved. Would you slip your hand up for a minute that I may see it as a testimony? God bless you. You may put them down. So anybody here today would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I have what accompanies salvation in my life. 
But Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else today that would say, Pastor, pray for me today? I'm not sure. I wonder how many folks here today would say, Pastor, you know, these things that accompany salvation, there's, maybe there's some of these things God's been dealing with you about, and you've kind of been resisting Him. You've been fighting Him about it. And now you know why they're there. They're there because you're really saved. And God desires these things come along with your salvation. Never, listen, learn to always say yes to God. Learn to always say yes to God. You'll never go wrong if you'll always say yes to the Lord. I wonder how many believers here this morning and say, Preacher, God dealt with my heart this morning in the message that these that I would have in my life, the things that accompany salvation. Pastor, God spoke to me today. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, you may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, when we stand after I pray and the pianist begins to play and Bob will sing, I just want you to slip from your seat. Other people will be coming to the front to pray. Would you slip from your seat and come to the front and meet me? We'll have someone who's been trained take a Bible and they'll show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. If you're here this morning and you're saved and say, Pastor, I've received Christ. I've never been baptized. I need to be baptized. You come. We have everything prepared and everything ready for you to be baptized. And we'd be glad to have you be obedient to the Lord today. If you're saved and you're baptized and you believe this is a church you ought to belong to, God is leading your heart that way, then you ought to come and say, Pastor, I need to join. I need to be part of a, of a church. It just accompanies salvation. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, I want you to respond to Him this morning. Heavenly Father, we bow before You now. We thank You again for these decisions that have been made this morning. Thank You for hands that have been uplifted, indicating You've spoken to their heart. And I pray Your will will be done in each heart and life now, in these next few moments. Help every individual to do what You're bidding them do in their heart. And I'll thank You for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob is going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him this morning. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more had dominion for more than conquered we are turn your upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, 
Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you, Lord, for you meeting with us today and speaking to our hearts and I pray Lord we'll leave this place with that thought in our mind and in our heart that we have things that accompany salvation continue to use us this week Lord to be about your business make us mindful of people around us who need to hear the gospel Lord I pray you'll dismiss us now with your care give us a good Sunday afternoon and prepare us for the service this evening I pray in Christ's name Amen. Now, briefly, just real quick, I had a call this morning. This is amazing. Um, somebody let me know that Walmart over here at George's Row Road, I talked to the one in charge of this. They have a, a car show over there on Saturday. It's tied in with the Children's Miracle Network. Some of you have heard of that. And she was calling to ask if they have um, refreshments. They have the things they cook. They supply everything. They're looking for workers. And if we have four workers from our church that would work there next Saturday, to, they, they buy it. In other words, we, we cook the food, so we need somebody to cook and somebody to take money and give out what they order. It's, if we have four people, it's nine to four next Saturday, and they give us $500 to go towards the community. So it's 500 bucks for our church, and... And it's possible they have four of these scheduled, and if we do it each time, she said, it could go up to $1,500 that they would, they would allow us to use for whatever we'd want to use it for. And that's a, that's a pretty amazing thing. I told her about our carnival we just had yesterday, and I said, boy, that'd go a long way to helping out. By the way, we, just so you know, yesterday the, we, we, got the, you know, we went out and got big bags of ice. You know how many big bags of ice we went through yesterday? Huh? Ninety-three bags of ice and uh, I don't know if it was for my sake or not but I got my iced tea over here at Speedway this morning like I usually do on Sunday morning and the guy on the other side uh, Myra is the one who helps me usually and the guy on the other side by the way Myra FYI and he said it when I was standing there he said FYI we're out of the big bags of ice <laughs> you think he aimed that at me I, I don't know but I thought the timing was a little peculiar on that but uh, it was, uh, but is anybody, if anybody's interested in that, got a, got, do we have a few that could help? Okay, that'd be great. I need to call her this afternoon and tell her we have some folks who would do that because that's a great, great help for our church. And uh, we'll, uh, okay, make sure you see me afterwards so I can write your names down, okay? Because that'd be a great, great blessing for next year's fair, it really would, okay? Maybe even for dinner day as well, amen? And in November, we have a, Thanksgiving dinner Sunday. Not it's not the Sunday right before Thanksgiving. It's Sunday before that. But uh, we feed everybody a full full course meal on that day, and that that will go a long way towards that getting some of those things too. So praise God, He takes care of us. Amen. All right, let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.